Hey gang, for those of you who enjoy QF, a podcast about Howard Stern, and would like to donate to us just via PayPal, you can using the email address johnnythegreek21 at gmail.com. You can check the link in the description for the spelling, and it's also here on the graphic. And if you'd like to do more in terms of uh, donations or subscriptions, you can use our Patreon account and subscribe via the black kluge level and you can receive our weekly content that we're putting only on patreon it's exclusive for that platform and um anything over five dollars is just gravy guys we love you thank you so much makes me feel like a you know what though but none of that stuff impresses me i'm not a big uh star effort i'm not uh, really stop it just stop i'm not into stop, it please, please you think i'm a star please, effort please. why go <laughs> Because I've gotten friendly with uh, Kira. She lives in my neighborhood. That's because you're a star effort. No, she invites me to a million things. <laughs> Is that a star effort? She's a nice girl. What were you doing this weekend? I'm really into the Internet now. I've developed a love of the Internet. Mm -hmm. And I can't stand that this, this schlub, Phil Graham, is screaming that we have to censor the Internet. It's just, it's, it's repulsive to me. It's repugnant. Listen, I, I'm very well versed on the new technologies. You know what a SIM card is? Yes, I do. Okay. I do. I see it in my phone. I'm going to right. take the You're not only going to see it in your phone, you're going to see it in your car very soon, a SIM card. You know? Mm-hmm. And once that happens, it's called Game Changer. I never read the social media comments about the show. A, I can't stand social media because I hate that people have power now. You know, in the old days, if you hated me, you'd have to write a letter to the station. What do you think about Baba Bowie? What do you think about Artie? Everyone likes Artie. Artie's super funny. They yeah. describe him as, you know, a little bit crude, but funny and uh, they likable. Baba Bowie, everyone loves Baba Bowie. I'm reading the research, and then it gets to me, and they go, well, because Howard's so controversial, but maybe he's, this is the reason for the result. Like, 40% of the people kind of like me. The rest of them think I'm a fucking asshole. Really? Crude. Everybody disgusting. loves Artie. Oh, Artie, yeah. They love yeah, but him. are you sure they really know who me and Baba Bowie are? I don't know. They like you. And the other thought I had was that if the FCC does kick us off the air, how would we reach these millions of people that listen to us? Will we just fade away? What if we have an announcement to make to them or we want to communicate with them? This would be a great contingency. So make it free, make it up there, and let the fans have fun. And I didn't have any moderators, nothing. I said, let anyone come right with it. Up yeah, but. So now when you go on there, it's like thousands of posts of just like, I don't even know who the people are. It's almost like people who hate the show more than people who like it. And it's like you get on there and it's like, Stern sucks. He's a homo. Uh, Robin's a pain in the ass. That's a horse face. Uh, Artie's a, 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 a jack off. Um, you know, kill Howard. Oh, well, what am I going to do? <laughs> anyway, the birthday bash is there for you for free. And not because I couldn't sell it to a network. Yes, many networks did want it, but I thought this But who would nice. even think that way? I don't know, and it, the, the thoughts are so rapid. Welcome, guys, to QF, a podcast about Howard Stern. I'm Jim Fix, a.k.a. Fillmore, or vice versa. And with me, of course, once again, is Ben and Sam. How are you guys doing? Doing I'm good. Great. Good to see you guys again. Yes, it's been a long time, but we're trying to be, make this as regular as possible. Uh, this is part four, guys. We're going to be going through chapter three, but pri previous to doing that, we're going to play a couple clips that I thought b better to put them in sooner rather than later because this is the BU section and it's quite short, but the clips we have uh, are quite interesting, actually. So I'm going to start with the uh, clip that I found from... September 30th, 19, 2019, in which he addresses the Colford book, which I never thought he did. I was looking for it in 96 when the book was released, but I couldn't find any, any mention of it on Mark's Friggin. How did you find this? I was looking up in Mark's Friggin just, uh, I, I think it just randomly. I, it was talking about maybe a biography or I was looking for something else. And then as I was scrolling through, I'm pretty good at skimming, uh, like just l keywords. And I saw autobiography or biography and then he starts talking about how other people have tried and they, mm -hmm. <laughs> they made it a boring book or something like that i'm thinking to myself there's nothing the only thing boring about the the colford book 
it, it is a bit dry, but that's because he's only dealing with information that's been in print previously and he wasn't allowed to get FaceTime with Howard. If he could have gotten more behind the scenes stuff, it absolutely would have been way better. But then it might have also been a, a shittier bullshit narrative uh, because, you know, everybody would have been instructed to tell lies. Uh, but then that maybe that would have been better to <laughs> to uh, d- delete. Yeah, it would have been. Yeah, but it would have. But at the same time, he Colford could have used the previous sources to contradict completely the bullshit spin they were going to give him. Uh, so it might have been interest, more interesting regardless. But either way, this is from uh, that year two from two years ago. And I thought it was pretty, pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, so but, uh, up, I, got, I, got one more, I got one more question for you. If, if when you retire, right, if mm. someone was to write a write all book like behind the scenes and be vindictive, what do you think it would be? Me, Robin. Oh, <laughs> no, 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 be vindictive. Uh, you know what I mean? Like a PG or a. I don't know. So many uh, behind the scenes vindictive books have been written about me already. Mm. I don't even know why. Why? Is like, there any- okay, first of all, it's not books, it's book. A couple people have written books about him, but they're like that one A to Z. Howard Stern, I think you have that one, don't you, Ben? Yes, I. Yeah, I do. I, <clears throat> okay, there was one. Uh, there was one. The the A to Z list or something of the king of all media or something. There were a couple yeah. of them. So here's and one. Here's yeah. Go ahead. Howard Stern A to Z uh-huh. by Luigi Lucare, who um, I think he died about a year or so after this was published. Uh-huh. There's <clears throat> the Howard Stern book, uh-huh. an unauthorized, unabashed, uncensored fans guide. Yeah, forward by Grandpa Al Lewis, and it, this is kind of interesting because uh, there's stuff in here that I, I read through this. Uh, it's not it's not meaty, but there's stuff in there that you kind of forget because it's kind of been whitewashed. You know, mm-hmm. even the history, you know, even history of Howard Stern, which at the time um, hadn't totally whitewashed Howard yet. This stuff, yeah. you forget some of the stuff that Howard was doing back then. And sure. then there's this completely unauthorized Howard Stern by Matthew Hoffman. Um, none of these. Com- compare, of course, to the Colford book. Yeah, uh, that that one looks like a photo book from the Guggenheim. Yeah, what's, it's uh, what's the story with that format? I mean, it's like when when Music Land was around and they would just put out books every month uh, that to, to target mall shoppers is my, yeah. my guess. Yeah, and just be largely photo driven and. <laughs> It was probably a Bush book right next to it, and uh, yeah. <laughs> quick sales, and then you move on. It, it, it does. Re- it does remind me, like, remember Media Play, that store Media Play? Like, you would walk oh, yeah. in a mall, yeah, yeah, and you would see all the brightly colored displays. No, they still do these kind of things, but they're in magazine form. Like, you'll see the Harry Styles book, and it's just a bunch of articles compiled. Yeah. Rolling Stone will put them out under its other name, and you know, they, just, okay. they still do things. This, was, this one's hardback. Yeah. Well, either way, uh, Colford's the only one that attempted to make it a straight biography. And yeah. uh, like I said, it would have been – it would have probably been longer if it had been an autobiography – if he'd helped, if he'd been an authorized biography, not an autobiography. And uh, either way, here's him discussing it. Anything left to be vindictive about? The, you could no, be I – mean, listen, know. I, I mean – it's very hard to write a book about me because I really don't have any scandal. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I almost choked on that. <laughs> oh, hey, I date men successfully. <laughs> yeah, a mon- like it's like I'm still living in the monastery or I'm living in a jail cell. What are you going to write about me that I'm a dick? All right. That you never went out with him. Yeah, right. No, I didn't know it behind the scenes. I mean, a lot. I mean, I, I think if you were going to really write a negative book about me, you'd say that I was distant. That uh, I didn't hang out and party with people. Um, you know what I mean? I mean, it would yeah. be kind of a boring book, but maybe I'm wrong. I mean, maybe there's some, you know, maybe I am a scumbag and there's something interesting there. But um, as a fan, I don't think you are. I'm just saying, you know, these guys that go to the meetings and they see all the stuff that we don't see. What stuff you know, what they they say? I'll tell you what, what our, saying. Our, our, it wasn't too long ago we played. Excuse me. We played a clip from the uh, 2013, I guess, archive of him talking about uh, the Johnny Carson book by Henry Bushkin and how he was really upset. He was worried. He's like, I really, you know, I wasn't a fan of Johnny Carson, but I think it's kind of a shitty move for the lawyer to uh, who wasn't employed by him at that point. He was he'd been fired from Carson five years before he went off the air. And, uh, you know, that poison pen book, basically. But it wasn't a poison pen book. He was afraid he just saw that as what if somebody does that about me? Yeah. 
And the answer that he just gave is like a job interview answer where uh-huh. you are asked, um, so what are you, you know, what are your worst, what are your worst uh, attributes? Uh, and you say, yeah. I work too hard. His is, uh, what's the worst thing they could say about you? Oh, I was distant and I didn't really hang out with people that much. You've got to be kidding. That's the yeah. worst thing that you can think of about yourself. Yeah, I didn't party. It, it's a very boilerplate bullshit answer. Mm-hmm. Horrible. Meetings. Yeah. And so he's going to, this is like, as we get into it, it's a short clip, but Our meetings are 99% business. Honestly, it's like me sitting there going, Hey, here's what I think I would like to be doing on the show. How can we get there? And then the, the, the other guys who all work on this show say, never mind what you want on the show. Here's what we want on the show. And, um, let me pitch you these ideas. And, and if I'm comfortable with them, we do it. At 2019, I don't think there was a single meeting being held where he was involved. I think he was just pitched stuff uh, in absentia. And then he said, yes, 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 check, no, 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 no. And then they went about their business. I don't think by this point um, he was involved directly aside from the uh, approving and disapproving. I think he might have even had people like Marcy or uh, Gary saying, okay, yes. Yeah, and his list is just meet celebrities. That's the entire (laughs) list that he would give them. Uh, yeah, gay content and meet celebrities. Anything and now these days, of course, COVID related. If it's COVID related, wonderful. <laughs> and he'll just he'll just spout that off as for an hour a show now at least. It's my favorite part of the show. Yeah. I mean trans and TikTok. Yeah. Or, you know, whatever, yeah, yeah whatever, yeah, and just scat talk. You know, can I love. just say something about the uh, about the um uh, about the, his COVID stuff? He has wanted his entire career to be accepted for trashing a common enemy, you know, mm-hmm. for, for saying, um, you know, uh, it, it, he's never gotten it. You know, he, he, he's aimed for that and the media never celebrated him for trashing what he thought was a common enemy. He finally starts getting a taste of it with Trump where, you know, the media is like, Oh, we, you know, Howard Stern weighs in on his close friendship with Trump. And now he's getting a second wind of that, with his war on the unvaccinated. And finally, the media is celebrating him. It's just that, you know, Howard Stern goes after Joe Rogan for ivermectin. Or Howard Stern says, Aaron Rodgers. Um, fuck your freedom. Sure. Howard Stern goes after. And he's loving it because finally he's, he's able to satisfy his need to, to pummel um, an acceptable, acceptable enemy. You know, not nothing controversial uh, in terms of what the media thinks is controversial. And he's found it in the unvaccinated and the media cheer as he says, I wish you were all dead. Um, and, uh, you know, call him, you're stupid and so on and so on and so on. And so he's living out his um, his desire to be rotten and he's being celebrated. If people in the media are taking Howard Stern and they're hailing him as some sort of saint authority and authority on anything and Mm -hmm. they're forgetting his history and they're saying look at him and using him as an example while because it's convenient and using him as a great example of anything while excusing everything else Mm -hmm. that's embarrassing for their career if not excusing then ignoring for sure and on purpose and and they're not Everything. They just aren't even they're not even touching on it. Just like I never said the N word. I never they're purposefully. Mm -hmm. I mean, and it's so easy to look up. So it's embarrassing for them. I don't know why they're doing it. Well, I mean, the I was thinking of an ex, an analogy of a common. Well, you said the, the, the term you used, Ben, was common enemy, and I think yeah, following the um, the uh, attack on the World Trade Center. It was so easy for him to just say, uh, just turn into this, let's bomb the entire Middle East Mm -hmm. in in the Mm -hmm. wake of the anger and the feelings and the frustration, you know, of people. And then everybody could say, wow, this is great. Except a week earlier, people were going after him for X, for da, 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 da. But now suddenly, because he's saying something we like, he's good. Yeah, I agree. You don't, (laughs) you maybe can't have it both ways. And uh, it's funny how the perception changes within a week. Like uh, we, I think Sam and I and Rave and I were discussing this as well. The the media turn, like the media spin within a week. Not a, no, sorry, the media spin. The media cycle within a week now seems to re reinvent itself. So it's a new story within a week because of ADHD um, 
uh, readers yeah. or viewers. So like the Alec Baldwin shooting a week later, uh, Aaron Rodgers becomes the the focus of the ire. And then a week later, yeah. it's the Travis Scott thing. And all of a sudden, Alec who? Yeah, yeah. It, 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 yeah. it's quite it's quite astonishing, even in 2021. Sam? I also think they're trying to give Joe Rogan a foe. So they're trying to give they need him to have an enemy. So who's it? Who's the obvious person to give? Howard Stern because but of his that's name. a mistake but that's a mistake and they're also right. saying like Joe Rogan's some trans hater that's not true but they just say it they just keep repeating that and that's right. not true and if you even looked up in Howard Stern's history as we did with the Tula oh, episode yeah. he's the trans hater yeah by now by now guys you will have seen it we covered the channel 9 episode with Tula the transsexual and uh, Caroline Cosi and um he it was it, it was so it was so brutal to watch. I don't think I'd ever seen it all the way through. I think I'd seen snippets of it and the photo that he puts in private parts of the book. But that's about it. And um, we couldn't get laughs out of it. We really we couldn't make it a laughing matter. It was really horrendous. And I'm not I'm not some social justice warrior. I'm <laughs> saying anybody would have been and should have been appalled and walked out why they didn't. I guess that British reserve like, you know, you don't let things bother you and they just they just kind of took it on the chin and how many years of, of siobhan did he did he did he abuse oh, her yeah. and right i mean uh, it was it was a in order to win a television a plasma screen television right. you had the punishment was to yeah, have punishment. siobhan squat on your face yeah mike um, mike high pitch mike <laughs> whereas now howard would say that's the prize right to have a trans person sit on your face but this but gets I washed would, away. i wonder if sunny if sunny was asked Will you formally apologize for claiming that Howard Stern has used the N-word? Would she? Because she insisted he did, and he said I didn't. So would she say – would she yield to him and say, oh, OK, I was wrong? Yeah. Because uh, if she won't, then she should press the issue. Mm-hmm. Not like I'm not I'm not the fucking uh, people who work here, and I'm not – I mean, what, what are you going to write? But enough has been tried. You know, I mean, you can you can find some people who've written up early on in my career. There was a guy who worked for Newsday, wrote a book about me, and it wasn't complimentary at all. In fact, <laughs> early <laughs> on in my career, 1990s, that's, that's like just your, your 20, second almost 20 book years. Yeah. 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 If you read the book, you would kind of say, hey, he, he um, all these other guys who some of them I don't even know are responsible for my career. <laughs> okay, so we obviously know, like, there's no way he'd deny his feuds with um, uh, the Grease Man or, you know, Man Cow, for example, which are more recent. I mean, not recent, but relatively more recent. Uh, but he, earlier in his career, that you, as you'll find later in the book, there were, absolutely was this uh, admission from these self-same people that he claimed they stole his act and that was his always that was always his M.O. when he was going up against somebody else. Mm-hmm. And so by saying that, you're addressing the fact that these people exist. So for him to go on later on and say, I don't know who these people were is complete horseshit. Hence why we're playing it. Yeah, I, I once tweeted an article from I would say I think it might maybe 82 or 83 it was when he was new to New York. Mm-hmm. And he told the interviewer that he had to leave Chicago because there was a guy there who had stolen his act. And told everyone that Howard stole his act. He wouldn't name him. Of course, he's talking about Steve Dahl. Steve Dahl, but, yeah. Yeah. But, of, you know, the, the, the fact that Howard yells out first, everyone stole from me, doesn't mean you're not the thief. Yeah. You just got to the press first. <laughs> right. He saw the Volkswagen first. Sam? <laughs> when he's talking like this, you can just hear how he sounds. And it's like, yeah, you know, some guys are maybe some uh, some people i don't even know these it's He's unconvincing so purposefully vague it's it's done that way because i i think in this particular case if i have to play armchair psychologist which i guess i do too often um that he knows he's full of shit in like you know when you're in the middle of an argument and you've lost complete faith in your argument before it even comes out of your mouth that's what he sounds like like i don't even believe what i'm saying i have to say it though it's a compulsion like i believe mm-hmm. i know that i'm full of shit but i'm going to try my best to 
you know, see if I can bullshit this guy on the phone. That's who I'm playing to. Never mind that I know other people are going to listen to this and record it and, you know, whatever, and have their say with it. And they do. The online community, when they heard this, would have at the time said, that's complete bullshit. <laughs> and I don't and I don't even know them. But uh, nevertheless, you know, so people early on try to make some money writing kind of like, I guess, a, a tell all of my life or a scandalous book. And then they got too bored. And I don't think any of them sold well because they're kind of boring. Bob Grant calls into the show 1996, April 19th. Uh, and thank you, Mark Spriggan, for helping me with this. On our line right now is the recently fired front page news, Bob Grant. Bob? Uh, yes, Howard. How you holding up, Al? Uh, better than I thought I would. Bob slammed me real good. He wrote a new book. Yeah. He slammed me all over the place. Someone sent it to me, and I was laughing. <laughs> I didn't know that. I don't... This is, so so th this is key, guys. He, 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 he claims he was slammed in the book, but then can't remember what was said. <laughs> this is on par with something Deborah and I covered, where uh, Lloyd Grove wrote an article about him ripping off Johnny Carson, but then he got mad at him at the restaurant and said, you know what you wrote about me. I don't know. What was it? Well, don't you remember? <laughs> I, I, no. And then Beth, remember, he was, he he was really back. upset. Yeah. And he was going to go down and charge him. Yeah, and, exactly. But he couldn't he, remember he, what he said. All of a sudden he was Chuck Zito. Leave a word of it. I don't believe Bob really feels say? that way. I don't know. You, what, you, what were you saying? I, I didn't even understand what you were saying. You were saying something about <laughs> the F word. And my I, Bob, what did you say? I don't even know. I don't even know. Uh, <laughs> did you write the book, Bob? Bob yeah, didn't write I did. the book. Bob and I one of the few people that really wrote his own book. As a matter of fact. Uh, I wrote mine, Bob. Okay, so that's him. Ooh, again, with Bob ooh. Grant, who he claimed didn't exist. He just said, I wrote mine, Bob. Now, we know recently that he said about private parts and Miss America that he disavows mm -hmm. them because he yep. was uh, made to write things he didn't believe in and mm -hmm. he didn't even write them all himself. Right. Uh, when it was first out, he couldn't be more proud of those books. Oh, God, yes. Jesus, and signed thousands and thousands in I person. He, I think he went on The Tonight Show and said, unlike these other phonies, I actually wrote my book. Right. Uh, and he just said that he wrote yeah. his <laughs> just there. Yeah. You mean you can't cure homosexuality? <laughs> Which was Sarno has been disproved. So important to him that he put it in both books. Two books, yeah. And, and, up, and up until even Sirius still maintained that. I have the clips. I have the audio somewhere. Uh, the next clip is from 2011, June 20th, and he talks about Alex Bennett, both of whom, Bob Grant and Alex Bennett, as you guys might remember, was in the third episode of Colford, The Breakdown Near the End, where we get, played clips of them as an example of what he tried to model himself after back in the day. But the best is Alex Bennett, who works here at Sirius. Uh. And, and honestly, I did forget that Alex worked here. And uh, I've never met the gentleman. I don't believe I have. But um, he's very full of himself and very upset. <laughs> you know, there are times I, I, I love this place and I'm so proud and, and, and feel so proud to be a part of what I consider a great broadcasting. Um, and by the way, the only reason this broadcasting thing ex exists for you. OK, guess what he's going to say. <laughs> this is also keep in mind, guys, uh, I don't know if it's post law. It's definitely post lawsuit. Uh, but the res I don't think the verdict has been reached yet. Perhaps I, I can't recall exactly. I know he f he signed with them for the contract for the new contract, and then sued them. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I just don't know when. I just can't Let remember the exact timeline of when the verdict was rendered. Let me guess. He invented satellite. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> you, my friend, is because of me. Just remember that. Yeah. <laughs> as much as it kills everyone around here to admit it, especially management. <laughs> because they all take credit. <laughs> I seem to recall Sirius hired you. Color me surprised. <laughs> yeah. This must have been just during the lawsuit then. This was 2011. 2011. Mid 2011. Uh, summer, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this was, uh, you know, this was just ahead of his, seri of his AGT announcement then, yep. right? Yep. Um, just so he was getting work done every couple of weeks on his teeth, getting his all new teeth installed. Oh, yeah. And then it started to become <laughs> he was so confident in AGT that he started calling radio his part time job. Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. And eventually we're going to do an AGT before and after show. Uh, I don't think it'll be a saga, but it'll just be a collection of clips. You know, the early days of how serious he was going to take it. Don came in with that fedora. <laughs> it was you almost you like. Find, then? You have to find how much he loved Simon Cowell at the beginning. He oh, yeah. would take calls from Simon, be so proud that Simon was interested in him and all that he kind of stuff. A, he and, was a guest for a decade, going on a decade. Yeah, uh, you know, right. Regularly. But in going into this, you know, oh, yeah. Simon called. He said he's very pleased with what he's seeing. You know, he, oh, yes. He, you know, he was buying Simon a gift for his kid. And then it was all of a sudden, <laughs> Simon fucks his friend's wife. That's yeah. the bro code, the bro code, the most important yeah. thing to Howard. Totally. Um, I mean, what do you think Simon would think of the bro code of fucking your stylist on a movie set <laughs> he just yeah. he might say you're going to hollywood you're in hollywood um number th- okay chapter three guys i i didn't have this clip I, I if i did i don't know where it is but mark shabjevich god bless you sir uh raven sent me a clip of this from a clip from 93 on another channel um i can't remember the exact clip but it was a billy west era clip and it's called 19 year old wiggy lusted after 15 year olds thanks mark it was terrible i was attracted to all the campers they were like 16 year old girls i was only 18 or 19 yeah you know I was they like, weren't 16 mm. <laughs> holy hot diggity good <laughs> yeah well i maintained my composure yeah. i was always the professional unfortunately but um anyway I mean, we're going to play clips that kind of uh, d- they double up on this with the whole fascination with the Olsen twins being 13 at the time. And then Millie Bob- Bobby Brown and the agent thing later on. There's a, a thread running through the well, he's show. He's forever 13. He, he's forever 13. Yeah, which is fine when you're 13. But when you're 67 and lusting about teens and at and, and this point, OK, 1993. Um, let's see. Well, did you for, see 42, 41. Seen- You've seen the photo of him with the 13-year-olds, right? Yeah, we've, I've got it somewhere. They, yeah, absolutely. They're not Can't hubba stop. hubba types. I don't know what he's talking about. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe <laughs> maybe well, he was charitable. Ben, ben has something there when he says he's forever 13. I mean, we went yeah. through that Friends interview where he was no. constantly – he had the whole cast of Friends in and what did he do? He spent the entire time in reliving Friends middle school and high school years. Oh, yeah. I mean, it was – ridiculous it was painful they were like move on and he wouldn't yeah i wish i I don't know if there was um ben you do you you still have that you still listen so you still have a subscription do you ever i don't listen to the interviews oh no but do you do you ever Uh, rarely do you you have you have access to video the the videos that they release i've never watched any of his videos but yeah i i do have access to it but i don't watch the app Okay, I'd be curious to see the reactions of the Friends cast at some of these questions. If it was the full interview, if you can manage to get the video to yeah. me somehow, or just like little segments of it, I would be indebted, like some screen caps okay. or something. Oh, that I'm would not be sure how I do that. I'll uh, see if I can figure out a way to do that. Is it? I'm sure it's on demand since. Yeah, it's the Stargazer Network now, so I'm sure they have that on there. <laughs> wow, what what happened to Rail Whale Rock? Um, okay, so that was, and I'm sorry, guys, that was Camp, where he's finished with Camp, going into BU. But then I think his first year at BU, he still did go to Well Met. Yes, he did. Yeah, yeah as a I mean, counselor. he was a cancel, counselor at age 20, so he entered BU at age 18, um, enters a sophomore year at age 19, and then the summer. When he's 20, the summer between sophomore and junior year, Mm -hmm. he's there lusting after the Mm 13-year-olds, allegedly um, nearly getting fired for fucking all of his coworkers. Which, which which, which, by the way, when that clip happens, when that – and I'm going to play that. That's part of this particular um, breakdown. Yeah. When that clip happens, he's not talking about camp. Like he, He knows he's talking about camp, but he doesn't say at camp. He said, my coworkers. Like, yeah. like he said, I was fucking like what? Like he said, I was fucking too many people. I was dating a model in college. He was conflating college and the high school years together. Well, uh, he was a counselor in college. That's right. So it was all high school to him also because he was and, a basic you know, studies. I, <laughs> and I say, I know you want to say something, but I just want to point out, he always claims he was with Allison since he, since he was 19 years old. He's always, I've been okay. the same with him since I was 19, which yeah. means then if he was at camp counseling at age 20, lusting after 13-year-olds, fucking all of his coworkers, then he was cheating on Allison. 
they claim that they met in their junior year, or at least that's what Howard claims. Mm-hmm. But uh, in the history of Howard Stern, Dr. Lou says, that's not true. I was there when they met. It was not at some party with the rain. They can put whatever they want in there, but that's not how it happened. When you guys went to college, did any of you go to prom? Like, Me? No. Did any of you seek to go back to prom? Did any of you, like, seek Are you talking about high school go... prom? Yeah. Like, Wait what a minute. The f- uh, Howard I... went back to high school prom as a 30-year-old. Where he offered himself as a date. I remember that. I mean, what is this? I did. This is crazy to me. Like, what is he doing? Why would you do this? Well, he, you know, I, I diagnosed him with Peter, Peter Pan sexual syndrome years ago, <laughs> but he really does have Peter Pan syndrome. It's when you, How when you look into what, when you look into what Peter Pan syndrome is, and I have the book that, um, that, that this uh, whole theory is based on, um, when you look at it and you see what it is, then you realize Howard is just a very unremarkable Peter Pan syndrome guy down to magical thinking, which mm-hmm. he talks about all the time. That magical mm-hmm. thinking. I mean, it's in the book, the Peter Pan syndrome book that that that's what they suffer from. This belief that they can will things to happen magically. Mm-hmm. Howard think has he would, yeah. You think he like loves the book, The Secret? <laughs> well, he wouldn't love. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, he, I mean, he's <laughs> Oprah loved that book, right? And he loves Oprah. <laughs> um, but he, what if idiots? You look at what Peter Pan syndrome is. You realize that Howard Stern is actually just a textbook, <laughs> not even remarkable, just a textbook yeah. Peter Pan guy. Yeah. If anyone ever told me they like the secret, I knew I couldn't be friends with them. <laughs> okay. Well, the uh, as uh, with with regards to the Allison clip, I will look for it near when we get closer to that point, and then just just drag it up sure. and see if we can find it from Mark's friggin' and stuff. Okay. Um, so we're actually going to get into chapter three, guys, and this one is called uh, Wingtardo starts grade thirteen at Boston University. Howard chose Boston University because of its reputation in teaching broadcast communication. Okay, so let's let's see. Everybody can, if you want to follow along with the bouncing with the bouncing wig, it is page twenty eight in the hardcover, and um, the, the we have to read this because, to be honest, it's not in the audio, and that's why. Uh, we're doing this. He how, Howard turned down an acceptance to Elmira College in upstate New York and chose Boston University because its reputation in teaching broadcast communications. However, his indifferent grades at Southside Senior High School <laughs> denied him immediate admission to BU School of Public Communications for the first two <laughs> years in Boston. He had to park himself. I love that. I love the way you phrase this. He had to park himself in the College of Basic Studies, a name that all too clearly labeled the preparatory com- program as a holding pen for less than stellar students, some of whom derisive, derisive, derisively, derisive, derisively. Here's how he, he derisively, um, derisively. he, uh, by the way, I suspect that he chose Boston uh, University because Dr. Lou chose Boston University. Nothing Maybe. to do with, um, with, I mean, he, he had to go where his crush went. Yeah. But um, here's what he says in private parts about Elmira. Okay. Um, Elmira was an all girls school. But they were taking boys for the first time ever. I heard this. I said, unbelievable. Five boys and 2,000 girls. Or they told my parents, if he ever wants a shot at radio, he could go to Boston University. They had a retard program called Basic Studies <laughs> where you took <laughs> one class for two years. And if you proved yourself, you could go to the School of Communications. Now, he acts as though that that's, nece- that's, a, that's an, an average student. Well, first you go to retard school. And yeah. then you get to go. That's not the career path for most or the the, the uh, educational path for most students. That's no, for the um, the very poor students. Poor That's for the students. dumbos. Absolutely. Yes. So so some of whom derisively referred to the setup as the 13th and 14th grades. At the end of sophomore year, those in basic studies either matriculated into the general population of BU for their junior and senior years or transferred to other colleges. Um, and then you're going to get some more of the reading that with the, the audio that we do have. So one sec. Number two, Howard might have enjoyed wearing chaps instead. In those days, Howard had long hair and looked like he weighed no more than 110 pounds, so skinny that his jeans always hung off his butt, recalled Ellen Fuckerman, who became a friend in their <laughs> what <fresh a> name. <laughs> <laughs> That's what Howard should be called, Howard Fuckerman. Yep, absolutely. Uh, so it says, so that's part of that. And it said, um, 
he was really, really lanky. This is Ellen continuing. And his hair wasn't just long. It was the thinnest, most unruly long hair you ever saw. He sometimes stuffed his, stuffed his locks into a hairnet before going to bed at night. <laughs> See, I thought this was proof that he was bald because it said it was the thinnest. Yes, so if your yeah. hair is the thinnest, mm -hmm. now, if your hair is thin mm -hmm. in college, uh, at, at 20, it doesn't get thicker. Your no. hair doesn't get thicker with age. I'm sorry. That's no. that's impossible. It's impossible. What's, what's it gets thicker stuff? with pregnancy, but I'm sorry. Men what, don't get pregnant, even if you have an emoji. Called, what's the stuff called? Propecia? Um, yes. Whatever the stuff is that people take to, guys take to, I guess, not reduce, slow down or reduce hair loss or whatever. Yep. It's and it so comes with make it, your hair thicker. It, com it comes out, it comes with a mess of side effects. So I don't know that it's th the best thing. Maybe you guys just accept your, it's gone. Um, I know that I had really thick wavy hair, but then when it started to go, I just let it go. Um, at that time, I mean, let's see, uh, uh, Kojak was maybe a couple of years away. He must've, he was so, he was so like horrendously, unattractive i know that even back then he must have thought the longer hair i can cover my face and then you know if i if i lose this hair people are going to see me 100 percent of my face mm -hmm. and that's just too much of a percentage for people to bear so i can understand why he'd want to stave it off but he, it, it didn't it didn't suit him you sam you remember those videos when he's got the ramones in studio he looks like the fifth ramon of course yeah and that part, that part, like just to the left or to the right, like the natural part in his hair, where it was clearly thinning when he would it was, have it a certain way. He, his natural hair, exactly as described in this testimony, it was the thinnest, most unruly long hair you ever saw. That's exactly how it looked until he started wearing whatever... I don't know, the, installation that happened. <laughs> yeah, the weaves. When he went to early 80s, he went to the weaves. And, and maybe even earlier he tried, uh, like, just regular wigs. Um, okay, let me see. Uh, here we go. Uh, Quaaludes were the recreational choice among the beautiful people. This is on page 29, second paragraph. Whereas Howard's small circle of hippie types preferred pot. And... Um, this is I, I think I thought I clipped some of these, but uh, uh, there might be a little bit in and out of order. Um, this next one goes into TM and that paragraph is slightly truncated as well. One sec. Uh, we By the way, the quite oh, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Just uh, let me just play this one out and then mm -hmm. we were all screw offs. We were all smoking pot. It was early in Howard's stay at BU that he developed a serious interest in the mystical and embraced transcendental meditation. Okay, yeah, go ahead, Ben. Oh, I was just going to say that um, he claims in Miss America that the drugs that he did in college are what caused him to have OCD and suffer with it for the next 20 years silently. Right. Not right. one person knew the trauma he was going through. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's it was obviously just fiction invented for Miss America. He needed some kind of revelation and that mm -hmm. was what it was i've been silently suffering the the loudest crybaby in the room is going to be stoic about suffering like he was uh yeah sam it, it's exactly right it, he it's almost like an andy cohen real housewives character who's bored and needs a plot line for the next series yeah. or she's going to be kicked off for a season i mean it's unbelievably dishonest in private parts, he goes to great lengths to illustrate that, okay, he was a loser, but he tried to be the resident, you know, druggie, basically, of BU or the, like, in high school as well. Like, it was, he thought it would make him look edgy, but yet we went through his high school experience, and they are like, he wasn't the most remarkable, he he wasn't a druggie, he was a square. Like, he absolutely was untalented at basketball, any sports, unremarkable in education-wise, uh, couldn't hang out with girls, couldn't meet girls. Um, was not even the funniest, didn't stand out at all. So to create this narrative of, you know, being the, you know, the burnout kid, he wasn't even a burnout. He was a loser amongst losers. Well, this is the problem that we come up with when we're doing this is pick a lane because he doesn't <laughs> have one. He no. goes down every single one. So he yeah. tries to be the burnout, 
the um, cool kid, the stud, the loser, the nerd, the mm-hmm. study, the the radio guy, the underdog. Yeah. Everything. He tries to be every single character. Right. Pick a lane. <laughs> you would have been better off. He's got a he's got to fix a screw and he just pulls out every attachment on his Swiss Army knife to try and fix it. That's pretty much my analogy. Ben? No, I was just going to say the and the way that he would describe himself is not the way anyone else would describe him. Right. Um, never you know. never they they never gel. They never, they're not, they're not the same thing. Now, right. this next clip guys is it, it, the, the King Schmaltz Bagel Hour which was a a takeoff on um the, the uh, King was it called the Flower uh, King Biscuit Flower yeah, King Biscuit. Power Hour or something like that? Yeah. And um, it, this happens here, of course. It's uh, I'll play the audio first of all. It's it says here um, King Schmaltz Bagel Hour snippet. Bob knew two guys, a guy named Bruce uh, Katz and Joel Joel Cohen. Yeah. And these three guys had a, some kind of weird radio show, and I was talking to Bob, and Bob said, hey, you're pretty good. Bob was a senior. He was a year ahead of me. This was junior year, and he said to me, you're, he goes, you're real good on the radio. I want to do something with you, which I was honored that an older guy would want to do something with me on radio. And we started to talk, and we formed this King Schmaltz Bagel Hour. And the real talents there were Bruce and Bob. And Joe. I'm going to let this play out, guys. All in my opinion, I think I was the weakest one on there, but yet I was the kind of the anchor of the show, much like today. And I would show up and we would. He is the weakest link of his own show today, now, too. That doesn't change. Anchor in terms of dragging the thing down. You know, <laughs> the way that you would think of. Not anchor like anchor man, anchor like albatross. Barnacle. Anchor, <laughs> like moss on a rock, yeah, giant cement block. <laughs> <laughs> like, he was okay. Let's see. But why? Well, you know, I think these guys would have heard him and go, "We need." Basically, they needed a Robin Quivers to bounce off of because, you, as you'll hear, Howard is not the the wild man of the show. He's nothing right. in the show. The uh, he's the nervous Nelly of the show. Right. I'm going to place either. We're going to play quite a good bit. We're going to play quite a good junk of this because I want people to hear exactly how awful it is. Try to do comedy. And I think the show sounds so much like what I do today on the radio. Are you listenable? <laughs> Complete shit. <laughs> Keep in mind, guys, this was the history of Howard Stern was um, this started in 08, I think, when they started part one <laughs> or 2010. Something like that. Yes. Yeah, so it, it continued. Seven maybe? It continued. Uh, 07, maybe? Yeah, 07. It 08. might even have been 06 at the end of the year. I, I remember whenever it first aired thinking mm-hmm. I was going to be very interested in it yes. and realizing I don't even recognize that voice. And right. I did. I mean. I appreciate it now very differently. Back then, I didn't. I, back then, I just go, I don't really want to hear it. Right. Uh, I didn't like the material. And what Howard thinks, I, I, I know that Howard <laughs> didn't go back and listen to these King Schmaltz tapes because he certainly wouldn't describe them this way after, he, at least not honestly, after hearing oh, them. It's almost like he would rather, in lieu of you playing them, why don't I just describe them to you? <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's what he's trying to do. I have king shits baby. <laughs> king baby's shit hour. <laughs> you know, it was the shape of things to come. <laughs> I know Sam was laughing because you're seeing all the young dudes, <laughs> all the young campers. <laughs> <laughs> Dare, dare to admit your insanity? Well, there are two people. <laughs> I, pushed, I pushed that ahead, guys. That wasn't an audio minute, glitch. This is, <laughs> this is King Schmaltz. I know what this is. I forgot. This is King Schmaltz. I mean, it's Howard doing some spooky. But it sounds like there's a combination of him doing the jerk off sound with the cheeks. Along no, no, that's with, bats like, flapping. Echo. That's bats flapping. Is it okay? Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, but, no, but I, I mean, like that's the sound, the sound, the, the same sound you might try to do if you were doing that, but also the delay or whatever echo. Yeah, <laughs> Sam. Sorry, didn't mean to make continue. you choke no. on your drink. I'm sorry. Continue on. By the way, I'm for this podcast. I'm drinking out of a Yogi Bear cup. 
for anyone. <laughs> Not you didn't want the ranger. <laughs> Park Ranger. <laughs> Bob Patrick and Howard Stern. <laughs> Thursday night from 7 to 8 o'clock. <laughs> I'll play the hour. And they're crazy. <laughs> I mean, it's free radio for college students, but you could see people tuning out in droves. Just like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, King Schmaltz is a spook show where yeah. you hear ghouls in the background and stuff. Right. Is like, this, this sounds like something show? that should be on Richard Christie's playlist for uh, October. Yeah. But it doesn't even sound spooky. It just sounds it, wrong. It just sounds like an accident. Yeah. Yeah. I'm still waiting for Gilbert to come in. Listen to them, children of the night. Yeah. <laughs> From 7 to 8 o'clock, the King Schmaltz Bagel Hour. Do you dare to admit your insanity? <laughs> okay, and this is what I'm going to tell people, uh, like, just to make sure they understand completely. If he's 20, right? He's 20. His voice is finished modulating. He's not he's already got he's he's got his adult voice now. Yes, in 30 years you can change and if you're a heavy smoker certainly your voice will change over time. But listen to how high pitched it is at yeah. 20. And he's trying to disguise it with reverb and you know all that echoing. Like can and I just absolutely. talk like this at all times and you guys be normal? When I was a kid, there was when I was there. There's a thing you could send away for Marvel was selling these. But you, I think you could get them at some stores, but very rarely. Little like utility belts, but for the Hulk. And what they had for the Hulk was a voice modulator. Was essentially like a seashell that you put your mouth to and you start speaking. Ah, oh, I'm the Hulk, whatever. And it would just muffle your voice really badly. That's what it sounds like he's mm. using. You know. Mm. Um, anyway, it's just nuts. I'm ready to- <laughs> The name was a takeoff on the syndicated rock show, The King Biscuit Flower Hour. Yeah. But any similarities between the two shows ended there. Here in a long lost demo reel, a 21 year old Howard Stern gives the Oh, you've got to hear this. Sorry, what's that? You've got to hear Howard <laughs> describe <laughs> professional Howard enunciate. This is so. If you thought what you just heard was cringe, wait till you hear this. Okay. Bagel hour. It was January 1975 when I was first approached about doing an hour comedy show on campus radio station WTBU. A buddy of mine, Bob Petrick, had been hanging around TBU for a couple of years and was always trying to pull the right people together for some kind of comedy hour. Howie, he'd say, let's do something creative already. Come on, we'll have one show a week. Oh, wow. <laughs> Sam's eyes are bulging like I've never seen. Yeah. This, this this is his demo reel that he thinks a program director is going to hear this and go, this guy has it. This we kid. must have him. Yeah. <laughs> Sam, go ahead, Sam. <laughs> Shocked at the submission. She looks crazy. You know, it, but he he's so um, susceptible to uh, uh, his instructor. It, you know, because his dad. I mean, I don't know if his dad had yet taken him to um, vocal coaching, but he might have, because he is really enunciating as he delivers this stuff and he yeah. obviously is reading from a script uh that he's written out for himself there's going to be a clip i'm going to play like because there's a whole bunch what i the king this is going to i should have just called this this whole episode the king schmaltz breakdown like at autopsy because i'm going to go from clip to clip to clip from spanning the years to where he says constantly they fired us they fired us and then ultimately saying no they didn't fire us so right. 20 well that's what years. everyone knows about that's what everyone knows about king schmaltz right so right. legendary they were fired yeah. in their first broadcast Right. And at some point true. he goes he goes on Larry King and he just talks a little about how his dad explained to him you got to learn how to be a broadcaster before you can, you know, change broadcasting. Okay, thank you for letting me process. Um <laughs> <laughs> I just had my mouth open for the last 5 minutes. That was insane. D d I just watched something. It was like a uh, the Microsoft TED Talk where it was like, "Hi, I'm so and so." I'm wearing a white shirt yes. and I have yeah. brown hair and yeah. I'm from, and it was like the most insane thing I've ever seen in my life. This is quite similar. What the fuck is this? 
It is he, the he most. He was always trying. Yeah, he was always trying out a new persona. Yeah. What is and now this? Now I am the slick guy who knows what he's talking about. It's so yeah. embarrassing. I, to me, which have... I can't believe I just did that. But that's I... that's. How he Do you know? Talking. Did you see There's that Microsoft it. TED Talk thing that I'm talking yes, about? Yes, yes. It's yeah. like it's supposed to be for the visually <laughs> impaired. They said, but yeah. Yeah, but it's for, not because uh, how would the visually impaired even know what red is? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> this is for. Well, I'm wearing a for... red shirt and blue shoes, and I have a mohawk. Well, okay, so yeah, I mean, and, and then there's no. Sh- this, the, I guess this is kind of the the point. He, it wouldn't have been so bad if he'd been able to admit that he was influenced by so and so and these people. No one would have given him shit, and we certainly wouldn't now. But he never does that. He adopts personality after persona after personality, and then decides, oh, I'm going to create this one, and it really is. Um, so much like uh, certain comedians in the business and after they've passed and people saying, I never got to know the real person or I never really I, I was never really privy to whether this was what they thought and this and that. Like Gary Shandling recently passed away and a lot of people have wax poetic, not recently, but they released that um, Judd Apatow documentary, which was interesting. I did enjoy it. But um, there were there was still like a disconnect. Like, did we really know who he was? Does the writing give us enough insight with him? You have to circle around Howard to get the real answer. You can't get the direct answer from him. You have to glean certain little segments, certain little gives, certain little tells on shows, put them together yeah. like this. Otherwise, yeah. you're going to be left going, huh? What? Who? Yeah. What? He, yeah. He's, it's amazing that his voice is his calling card, and yet he's never shared his that, real voice. You know, it's, it's never voice, a real voice. Mm-hmm. When you played that, the first of all, the cadence and – the delivery was shocking, but the most shocking is the tone. Like whose bass and tenor was that? I mean, what the hell? Whose voice well, is that? Yeah, he, he did admit um, that he used to record himself and then slow down the tape to make his voice sound deeper. Yep. That and is, that's certain. not his voice. That's not yeah. Howard Stern's voice. Well, listen, well, let's hear a little bit more of it. We're definitely going to hear yes, more of please. it. A lot of funny routines. We'll take phone calls and generally just have a good time. I mean, this sounds a lot like um, him and Fred in the in the uh, like uh, out of the closet stern. I, I'm in shock. Can we keep doing this, please? Yeah, don't stop. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I told Bob I would do it. The next step was to convince two friends of ours that the show was worth doing. The King Schmaltz brothers were myself, Howard Stern, Bob Petrick, Bruce Katz, who was billed a man of a million voices. And Joel Cohn. As soon as we straightened out the details, we decided that our show was to be named the King Schmaltz Bagel Hour. A lot of our you critics just, called us somewhat soft. <laughs> you could hear the smile on his face as he's delivering. Yeah. yeah. You know, and you could, I can even hear through these headphones the little squishing of his mouth and uh, teeth the joy. Uh, connecting. But um, yeah, you, you can just tell he's delivering it with this smile. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's so uncomfortable to listen to. Mark. But for the most part, our audiences loved us. Wednesday nights were something very special when the King Schmaltz brothers got it together. It's 7 o'clock. Time for King Schmaltz bagel hour. (laughs) He's rich a little. Our audiences loved us. Who is this? Yeah, so imagine the program director hearing this. How do you do it, crazy von Stutter? Stup, stup, stup away. Time to stup like crazy, you judge slogan of stupas. <laughs> yeah, time to stup with Bob Patrick and my friend Dina. Howard. And for the history of Howard Stern, I believe they just really isolated more of his voice than anybody else's, yeah. as if to illustrate, you know, it's it was really all about him, but by his own admission, in between segments, he's going, well, they were real, the real talents of the show. So why are we hearing so much Howard? I mean, it's great for us. Don't get me wrong. Sa- uh, Sam? Why are they doing, like, Fiddler on the Roof? Well, that's the thing. Well, they're King Schmaltz Bagel. King and it's Schmaltz funny. Bagel. Yeah, it's yeah. funny. So oh, it's, a very okay. Jewish, it's a very Jewish show, and yet uh, one, of the ca- one, of, one of the guys claims to be the only Jewish person there, and Howard doesn't correct him. Mm-hmm. And this was when you listen to this. I don't know about you guys, but the first thing I thought just now was um, how insanely 
angry and jealous he must have been of Billy West when he was hired and saw him effortlessly do these voices, which, which I mean, I may say effortlessly, but I'm sure it took Billy work. But he's struggling to get these voices at 20 and whatever, and they're just kind of bad. Kind of? Well, um, is 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 <laughs> Is BU uh, what what is the make of BU school like? What is the demographics? Stern, wonderful show, crazy for sugar for mesh. That's what the heck it is. Crazy, crazy show. King Schmaltz Beggar Hour. Listen in, crazy guys. Ah, uh, good to be back on the air. <laughs> Actually, this is the premiere show of the King Schmaltz Bagel Hour. Sorry. He's doing like Soul Train Radio or something. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to or doing Alice in Steel or something like a low yeah. rent version of night, after just, nighttime yeah, radio. After selling it as the craziest thing you're ever going to hear, right? Here's the reality. Myself, which is Howard Stern and Bob Petrick, say hello to the fans out there, Bob. We know we have a lot of people listening tonight. I've told everyone to listen. Oh, oh, <laughs> uh. Uh, over there. Oh, yeah, there we go. I think. Yes, you're on, Bob. No, the mixer, the mixer. Give me more, some more juice. Okay, what what number are you on? I don't you know. See, we're not too no organized idea. here. We're going to just give everybody more juice. Well, so you give this, like, yippity yappity, <laughs> like, <laughs> Looney ya, ja, 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 uh, music, this ya, ya, ya music, and then you're going to have this. Okay, so everybody, <laughs> we, are, we are going into this very relaxing tone of voice where we're going to be doing some yoga poses. So that's the, that's the tone of voice. How could you go from a cartoon ask music and then you're going to talk like you're going to be doing some downward dog. What is happening? (laughs) Yeah. He, he, it was a pizza pizza with every, uh, the kitchen sink thrown onto it. That's that's what it is. He and he and I'm certain like it's early days. He doesn't know what he what he's what his strengths are. No one's probably telling him, you know, this is good because they're themselves starting and they're all thinking, what the fuck? It's only Boston's it's only like college radio. Who gives a shit? Right. Mm-hmm. For it's mm-hmm. it's all for shits and giggles. Sam. OK, you and I don't know what we are doing. We did this. I mean, who, huh? I, I what do you what do you mean? <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, did I do you know think it 20... would be a good I do you think it would have been a good idea to put some Looney Tunes music on and then start talking like this? The thing is, this is and something he's going to talk about. If he had any kind of real love for radio, he would have understood that there are certain isms. And then that's what he's doing now is he's picking every single thing he's heard on the radio and deciding, let's see what fits best. Meanwhile, the minute you put a shoe on, it should fit. If it doesn't fit, fucking that's the wrong size. Pick another size. He's insisting on doing certain things regardless because he doesn't know. He's not smart enough to know this doesn't work. Uh, Ben? Yeah, I want to quickly read you something from Private Parts where he talks about King Schmaltz. <clears throat> Please. Keep in mind the delivery you just heard, and Sam, what you just said made me think of this. So here's what he says. This was outrageous then. We broke all <laughs> format. We had long bits. Listen to this part. Most of the other guys were these way too cool, soft voice, progressive sounding disc jockeys. Now here's <laughs> Pink Floyd on a trip to the dark side of the moon. We were crazy. On that first show, we also played a bit called Godzilla Goes to Harlem. That would be the last bit we play on college radio. Now, none of that's true. No. They didn't do the, they didn't do that on the first episode, and their first episode wasn't their last. And, of course, Howard is the guy doing the smooth, here's Pink Floyd guy that he's making fun of. Guys, we're going to sign off with Eat a Peach from Live at the Fillmore East. Now no. on WW, <laughs> WWWW. <W-W-W-W. laughs> I mean, but, yeah. But the point is, even if he was try, even what Fillmore said, where he's trying out certain things, we know who we are. So even if we learn as we go with certain sort of. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm in I my guess 40s. I- he's, a, he's a 20 year old with no experience doing radio. I'll give him I'll give him the benefit of that. Doing okay, but we know who we and, are in yeah, certain sort of facets as people and yeah. how we want to come off. There is no who the hell is this? What is Although this? to tell him to hear him tell it, Fillmore, he's been doing radio for 15 years at this point because he's been doing it in his head, in his basement, in his whatever. <laughs> Amongst other things. I know. Yeah, exactly. 
introduce. Well, I think I think it's an appropriate time to introduce our co-stars here. Yes, let's get that out of the way. So we, we just picked them in Kenmore Square. <laughs> and um, I'm wandering aimlessly through Kenmore Square. I'm Joel Cohn. I'm Bruce Cat, and if you say the secret word, you win a thousand dollars. Speaking of secret words and contests and stuff, uh, give us a call at three five three six four zero zero, and we have some very special prizes to give away, uh, some albums to give away to people, um, and we'll discuss those if details only later. the phone works. You see, we have some technical difficulties. Too. Hey, you can hear him. He's off mic. He's on mic. He yeah. doesn't know where the hell he is. He can't. And they, they have to be wearing headphones. They have to know what the sound's coming through. Like, go ahead, Sam. Oh my God! Only if he could scream at Fred right now. <laughs> yeah. I, one one thing I liked, he said, "Yeah, let's get that out of the way. Let's get the introductions out of the way. Let's get back to me." That's that's the way that's the way it sounded like. <laughs> if only he could scream at Fred. Uh, we're having some yeah, technical usual, difficulties. Yeah. Well, we're yeah, going to try Scott. and take some phone calls. I'm going to check right now and see if the phone works, so we can get ourselves organ- organizationally set up here. Um, okay, and I'll just mumble here. This is the King Schmaltz Bagel Hour, um, which formerly used to be uh, Studio Six Forty. And uh, formerly used to be Studio A, and formerly used to be that um, famous show. Subject to change yes. of last year, you could say it's a bastardized form of um, of all previous imitators of it. Now, keep in mind, guys, I'm going to give them also a pass because this is a recording of the actual broadcast, and maybe the quality is is dog shit, and they've done whatever they can to soup it up and make it better for more palatable. And I'm certain, actually, uh, Scott Salem would have done some trickery to make it sound somewhat better, but it's still shit. Like, the content is still shit. Wait, mm-hmm. what did he just say? A bastardized form of what? Well, let's, uh, let me just go right back into that. Hold on. Subject to change yes. of last year. You could say it's a bastardized form of, um, of all previous imitators of it. It's a... Um, what does that even it's, mean? It's, you know, I have no idea. Uh, like there are other shows that on the station, like on the at the, at the college, uh, imitators of the show that they're ripping off, King King Biscuit Flower Hour. I mean, I'm not quite certain either. Well, what it is is a, sh- a shortened version of Subject to Change, which used to ramble on for four hours. Subject to Change. That was the name of a show, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, had to be. Yes, we've gotten it quite concise here. Subject to change was out on format, and now we've gotten it all together, and we've put everything concisely into one okay. hour. This was Bob and I's dream for a long, long time, and we finally got airtime, and now we're ready. Actually, um... he sounds He sounds so relaxed. <laughs> Go ahead, Sam. Listen to this. Yeah. And now we got it concise to one hour, and now yeah. we're ready. You know what you know what he sounds a little this? bit like? He sounds like that one um that phony phone call person that they used to call all the time. Um what was the one? The the the, the one that was like a spiritualist that they'd call her, like Sal and Richard would call uh and say, Well, or Rusty, how are you, Rusty? Uh I forget her name. <laughs> this is what he's oh, the cranky her. caller guy? The yes, one, yeah. one? Uh, Yantra yeah. and Mantra. Yeah, yes, three. yes, yes. <laughs> Yes, I, that's why that's why I always say cranky call whenever I talk about their prank calls because she yeah. called it a cranky call. Yeah. Um, you know, the, to, the way Howard would tell this story, he had it all figured out with this early, I mean, very early show. He that's knew right. what to do and they had a hit on their hands. <clears throat> and then his evil father hears it, says, what are you doing? This is terrible. This is going nowhere. And it derails Howard for years as he goes. Right what he calls straight radio. Um, yeah. But to hear him tell it, this was it. This was the future of radio. And his right. father threw everything, uh, you know, th- th- threw a monkey wrench into all of his plans. Right. And yet at the same time, he admits, it, I have a clip, we're going to get to it eventually, where he talks about, it's strange that this would be uh, something I would uh, have have tried in college because for years I, I had expressed no interest in doing radio. He was too busy f- trying to fuck uh, underage girls at camp and or guys too. And then um, also, you know, like just saying like he, he didn't he wasn't progressing. He wasn't sorry. He wasn't pursuing radio the way someone who really loves it, the way he claims to have wanted it since age five, would do. You would immerse yourself. You'd make it a, a point to go with your dad to the studio and love it and enjoy it. Uh, you'd ask him for tips. You'd try to get in it wherever, you know, as an intern somewhere uh, at a radio station. Yeah, I, I think mean, Steve Dahl was on, Nash, uh, was on uh, local radio as a teenager. I think so, I'm yes. Gonna, yeah. 
Yeah, how, Sam? Thank God Ben told him this was terrible. Listen to this. How in God's name, this sounds like, you know, like when sometimes you have to listen to YouTube commercials and they try to sell you on things and it's like, you need, hi, you need Lately, I've been getting pillow. lately and... on YouTube. I've been getting Grammarly. I'm like, what are you telling me? My typing is excellent. Yeah. <laughs> this you... is the invention of you're hearing the invention of reality radio. That's how yeah. we call it's, it. And it's, it's just it's guys a... not talking real whatsoever. Yeah. It's incredibly disingenuous, and everything Ben said is correct. So I, yeah. I, I, for the life of me, like, thank God he ripped off people and listened to Ben because this is terrible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, at some point, I mean, if you ever heard the old classic live reads, some of them were excellent. The whatever, whatever he modulated his settings to, his voice, he certainly knew his way about. By the time he became a professional, he could do these live reads for you know bands, movies, whatever. He had an excellent uh, way of doing that. But again, it's all learned, and and there's no shame in that. But but the shame is <laughs> modulating your voice to make it sound differently, and 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 claiming you're an original. Go ahead, Sam. Do you think since he was at a monastery at some point, because this sounds a lot to me like an exercise class, like when you're calming down and we're all, going to get, we're all getting into he was a certain into position at this point. Yeah. So th this sounds very this voice to me sounds very like an exercise class that I've taken before, like where you have to get into a certain mode. Mm -hmm. It sounds very hypnotic and mm -hmm. a certain rhythm that I've heard before in certain people when you're in those types of classes, right? Well, it, it claims it claims here, and this is uh, this is in the, uh, the the TM section. It goes, um, yeah, as he took his first steps into radio at college, TM became a valuable tool of preparation. I'm not sure exactly how that was. Except if he, like you said, uh, Ben, he, you, he, the idea that he, it helped him relax to be more confident on the mic. But yeah. I don't hear that actually. Uh, what I hear is someone uh, just playing at it, really. So I don't know. I, I know we're a hate stern show, and that's our mandate. But I'm trying to be as you know objective about it as possible. It sounds like I don't know what I'm doing. Let's just say anything, whatever comes to mind. Let's be it, and that's fine. That's just that's you know. But you're right to, to pass it off as. The, the the this was the blueprint the cathedral is the howard stern show on sirius this is the fully realized dream oh yeah this is always yeah. the way i wanted it to be when he this, yeah he you fought, know he, he loves fought filming the show he fought um you know selling it as a tv show in studio claimed oh you can't maintain the intimacy if there are cameras in here and he fought yep. doing remote yep. interviews which he's doing now yep yeah, yeah. Everything so, he's known for, he he actively fought against. Absolutely. Uh, the crew here, the, the King Schmaltz crew here, agreed that if we don't offend somebody on this hour, we are going to um, jump off seven hundred yes. tomorrow. I mean, we're going to resign. Uh, holding hands in a circle. Actually, right now, in the nude. Yes, all this <laughs> Right. Actually, right. Did you see? He had to add in the nude. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Lord have mercy. Now we're just going to do something. Some other. Uh, unnatural act but um right now we will be distributing uh form letters uh and uh you should write them out to the free press and tell them how offended you were by this program so uh is there a phone call no there's no phone call no i'm trying to get the phone working just so in case anybody out there i know there's a lot of people listening but you might be shy to call up because uh we're, we're very intimidating <laughs> what, what 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 is there to be intimidated about we're, we're well I mean, he's being sarcastic by. He's uh, being, yeah. I mean, you can but, just yeah. hear the self-satisfied smile on his face at all times yeah. during this. That smug, smug smile. Yeah, totally. They're all just shooting each other's yeah. smiles. Yeah. yeah. No, we still don't have it together. But, Bob, you can keep telling people about our show, and then we'll get right into okay. it. Okay. Uh, live radio. I just want you to know. Tell them how funny we are, Bob. For those who yeah. feel that it is. This is live, and we're actually talking. Why don't you give Bruce some more juice there? You know what? This is the same echo chamber as it is now. Nothing has changed. It actually got great in the 90s and everything mm -hmm. else during the arty years. They evolved. And now it's right back to King Schmaltz. We are right back to where we started.
it's full circle and not only that i mean he did he repeated the circle uh two years ago or a year ago when he started doing the hand puppets on the air the sock puppets which is something he was doing in the basement uh you know i mean this is and now it's you know i will give you this there's there's a steve martin book out called born standing up and i'm not a fan of steve martin anymore i think he's an oh he just i just fucking hate what he's done to comedy but he said uh he went on the carson show and carson you know, uh, between uh, commercial breaks, he said to him, he goes, in your, you know, as you do your as in the arc of your career, you're going to use everything, you know, I want to just read to you another um, private parts uh, description from private parts of what Howard <laughs> yes, says. About Pink Schmaltz. <laughs> we were totally outrageous, especially for 1973. We used to talk about girls asses, heebs and blacks. <laughs> One of the guys did a game show hosted by Father. McNern called Name That Sin. The object of the game was to confess a sin that was so bad it would make the bishop blush. But I just thought that was so funny. We used to talk about girls' asses, heebs, and blacks. I I, I don't I, I've listened to this history of Howard Stern. I never heard a segment where they're just talking about blacks. And it's definitely not heebs because they're all pretending not to be Jewish. Cats and uh what what were the guys' names? Um the, uh, um, I'm sorry, I, he said it earlier, but I go, wait a minute, Cohen and so-and-so and Stern, and only one of them is acknowledging on King Schmaltz that they're Jewish, but they certainly weren't saying hebes. And no. I don't know this thing about blacks that they're talking about, aside from Godzilla Goes to Harlem. Right, and he's getting away with using a racial slur in his own book because he's Jewish, okay? That's, yeah, yeah. That's self-loathing, it's not racism, yep. but you know, anybody else reading that um, might, <laughs> might be a little up in arms. Um, but- well, this was also 1993, Howard. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm just going to find the right. Cl- I don't know that we need to play the entire King Bagel, King Schmaltz. But no, this definitely is- not. You might want to okay. play a little bit of Godzilla Goes to Harlem, though. It's just the the infamous, always talked about, never really heard. And okay. one thing you won't hear in it is Howard. OK, uh, let's keep going. Uh, the mixer's kind of messed up. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to turn up all the juice. I'm going to give it all we got because this is King Schmaltz. Okay, I know I know I have this one. They don't play the they don't actually play the Godzilla goes to Harlem. I think they just play the buddy calling in and saying you're fired. But yeah, um, yeah. this is yeah. uh this is the the I don't know, station program director for college right. station program director. Now he's yeah. obviously kidding when he says I'll give you a hint, you're fired. Yeah. They so we're going to take it that that's them getting fired even though they did another 12 shows after this. Exactly. What? Yeah, Why Sam? wouldn't they be fired for not being able to handle technical aspects of a radio show? Like, wouldn't they be fired because they can't handle calls? And like they just said, we couldn't. Didn't you just hear him say mm-hmm. we couldn't do the radio show? We sucked. Well, yeah, you'd think so. And certainly like when I was doing I did university radio and there was a protocol and you actually had, you know, people checking you out. There were always people, managers uh, or, you know, uh, station managers around the clock going, keeping an eye on making sure that the Canadian content laws were, you know, abided by and then that you signed off properly and you had read all the call letters, everything every so often and whatever. And so there was a standard, there was a, a protocol for sure. And them, <laughs> I mean, maybe it was just so, um, so minute uh, stage, maybe it was such a, such a low rent thing there at Boston university that they didn't take it seriously. So that wouldn't have mattered to management. I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. Who is this? Uh, three guesses. The first two don't count. The first two don't count. I thought we were quizzing you. No, no, no. I'm quizzing you. Oh, okay. So you have three guesses. So we have three guesses. Uh, uh, what's the question? You couldn't hear. The, the uh, King Schmaltz board has just been uh, asked. We have three questions to guess who this is. Are you uh, Mary? <laughs> <laughs> is it Mary? Is it Mary? Is it Joe? Uh, no. She drinks like Mary. And she drinks she like, like Joe. Joe. Oh. Uh, are you Sturgeon? No, I, I, I think it's it. not the card. This is horrendous. And he does play this later on. In t- I have a clip from 2020 where he actually uh, doubles up on this. I'll have to eliminate that from mm. the future broadcast. But either way, this is, yeah, it continue- this is almost finished. When he was this is uh, a Sturgeon and uh, Jane. Uh, I said, when we put one of our, uh, when we put the... Let me give you a hint. Okay. I bet you it's Hank. Excuse me? You're fired. You're fired. Was Hank? Well, we'll put one of our uh, expert researchers on it. <laughs> okay. So, Did Howard hang up on him after he said you're fired? No, I think he hung up on them. Oh, I see. Okay. 
Yeah, I'm pretty could sure. They, could they be any more boring? Like, even when they're ad living, I mean, could you guess any more boring things? Like, couldn't you, Santa Claus, the Tooth Fairy? I mean, could you guess Joe, Mary? You're guessing like subpar ad hominem names that are like the most sterile, boring names in the world? Yeah. yeah, well, I mean, no one ever accused Howard of being a, you know, a quick thinker, that's for sure. Uh, although he'd certainly I, I would say insist that, on it. I would say that the things that you could see, well, obviously dead air, but also mm-hmm. somebody else making a comment and then Howard repeating the comment to try to get credit for the comment. Yep. Or no, who, the, who was the biggest serial killer at the time? I mean, uh, did <laughs> Jesus, like, if you're, like, if you're supposed to be, like, the, the most daring, shocking radio <laughs> jock... Are you like, kidding? Is it the Zodiac Killer? Yeah. I mean, dude, come on. What? Okay, guys. So, um, 2005, late 2005, he goes on Larry King to promote series because he's going switching formats, switching, uh, you know, uh, mediums rather. And the beginning of the video, it's on YouTube. You can get it. I have the whole thing. He talks about the Kabbalah play that Emily, the controversy there, and he's he's never more uncomfortable than that. When he starts settling on this, it goes into the Godzilla goes to Harlem bit that he claims this is where he was getting more, uh, you know, we, we were fired for that. We were fired for that as if to say how edgy we were. Like that's that's my street cred. Yeah. We were so bad. We were so bad. We were badasses on Boston Radio, Boston U- University Radio. So here's what you're going to hear college radio and i started this and i got fired after the third show we did a big third godzilla goes to harlem and and you know no one ever heard anything like this and it was a college radio station carrier current and we did this thing and uh, i got fired right on the air and that was sort of an omen of what was to come and my father wrote me a letter and he said to me you know it's great that you're on the air and all of that but i listened to the tape and you go, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, every minute, and you fumfer on the air, and you don't sound professional. And okay, I'm going to play the rest, guys. You're not enunciating. And he said, you, even a clown probably was, an, uh, was a trained ballet dancer or something, and you need to go out and do a straight radio show. And in my opinion, learn how to, you know, do radio. Good advice. It was really good advice. And I went, and I did a straight show for two years, and I was awful. It was chronicled in my movie. And I said, you know what, though? It was the best two years of my life. I had to do everything at that station. Okay, Sam? Okay, so a clown was a professional ballet dancer. That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. No. no, that analogy is worthless. If if he got fired for the King Schmaltz bagel hour, which is clearly disproven. Mm-hmm. It will be. Yeah. It has, obvi- has been, but it will be proven. We're going to prove it ourselves. Yep. He didn't. It's obviously, I don't even know how he gets away with saying he was, he was taken off regular radio, which right. could be obviously disproven. The FCC mm-hmm. and everybody else didn't take him off radio. He took himself off radio. He took himself off radio. Nobody was coming after him. Well, he, he, he took hold on, hold, himself off radio and he put the narrative out there that people were coming after him just the well, way yeah. he is right now. OK, but he well, that, did. That was lose, how he, he did lose markets, which is proven. And uh, that's, well, he, uh, that's he, documented. he replaced those markets, though. They that's very right. quickly replaced them. And, and then, in fact, he gained markets. So he oh, was yes. actually True. better off than where he was. But mm-hmm. he in order to convince people who had been listening to him for free that it was worth paying for, he had to go and say, the government is coming after me. This is about free speech. Yeah. Um, so, but, you know, did you notice that he's wearing black and red there? Ralph yeah. had him costumed as this communist socialist character for some reason right. that he would be in black and red every single time he promoted Sirius. Yeah. What a what a free speech martyr. <laughs> so the next clip is telling Brian Cranston, I believe this is 2015 when he comes in studio finally that he got fired. So they're just pro- prolonging the lie over different decades. Love Godzilla. I did too. Oh my god, I got fired in college radio for doing Godzilla Goes to Harlem. Did your Godzilla <laughs> go to Harlem? <laughs> okay, so okay. And the reason, like, guys, I want this to span time, so I'm sorry if it's going back mm-hmm. and forth, but I wanted mm-hmm. it to be that way. So this is called The Truth About His Bullshit <sighs> Firing. Before you hooked up with Robin and Fred, what did you see your career being? I mean, did you imagine it would be everything it is today? And guys, this is from September 30th, 2019. 
No, I don't think I really thought it through that much, but I knew at five years old I wanted to be on the radio. But I mean, that was all I wanted to do. I knew I knew I would be on the radio, but there was it was a stupid kind of statement to make because even in my teens, I never even went and tried to be on the radio. Or <laughs> it's funny how he shoots down his own his own like yeah. purported ambition as a five year old. Well, we all five year olds know what we want to do. Yeah, okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Tend to my room to be on the radio. But you were and, like Billie Eilish rehearsing in yeah, your room. <laughs> in my room. And then I always oh my God. A show where there would be a group of characters. Incidentally, guys, that was the day Billie Eilish did come in. That's why her name is coming out. So, but I mean, someone who's like talented versus someone who's, you know, <laughs> anyway. Oh, just let the bark around your fucking rest. That's right. So we'll keep going. Yeah. You could hear the origins. You could. We even got fired. I know. In college radio. We started a tradition right then. Bob and I got fired. Because <laughs> we were responsible. I don't even remember why we got fired. I think for Godzilla Goes to Harlem, we did a bit. And I guess it included, um, I don't know, maybe it was the racial element. I'm not even sure why we got yeah, fired. Yeah, you did a whole rap on this one. Yeah. I'm trying to remember. I, it was weird. We got fired on the air. Because the program director. Yep. See, it was weird. It was weird. I don't remember, even remember. We always weird. Always capture this word. It was weird. Yeah, it's it more of a buoy. It's more of a buoy word than Howard. But buoy every every time it's something negative, he decides he's going to use weird to guys. It was weird. The word. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if it's it yeah, he always weird. he always doesn't yeah. know. I don't even know. I don't know. Yeah. He's every time he's been fired. I don't even know why they fired me at NBC. <laughs> you never asked. Does what everybody not know why they got fired in their life? Because oh I, I don't know. Fucking to you, everybody knows why they got fired. Yeah, or dumped nobody, or whatever. Nobody is, nobody is weirded out. Yeah. Everybody knows why I they love, got imagine fired. Imagine he's got on his resume, you know, reason for leaving last job. He writes, I don't know. I love uh, when Benjamin, we were covering the Quivers of Life over at the other place and we we, we did the recording and the, he his favorite quote, it applies to Howard too, uh, that you said, Robin is always a passenger in life. Yes. <laughs> like taking yeah. it wherever the river I, takes her. <laughs> yeah. I That particular phrase that she always uses and when I hear other people using it, I get suspicious of them. And it's, I found myself this. Yeah. I found Fate myself led, going to this. Fate led me to... As X, if it's X, quantum X. leap and you just woke up in this body <laughs> doing this thing at this moment. I I get mad at people for this too when they do this thing where it's like they make conscious choices and they're then they are a victim of the choices that they make. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. you you made choices she and was, now you plead victim. It's she was like, particularly bad because she went on Sally crazy. Jesse doing the book tour saying that the army, the Air Force made her stay. She was forced to. Meanwhile, in her own book, she says, I I, I chose to stay so I could pay off the overpayment right. they gave me, which would be the equivalent of like $50,000 today. And right. she got pissed off because, well, how was I supposed to know you were overpaying me? Um, you look at the numbers on your check and you figure out that they don't make sense. And you approach and the them. fact that you're the one who's going out shopping sprees while the people who are the same rank as you are like struggling. He's doing. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. but these yeah. people, they get to be victims, right? Yeah. They get to they get to they get to spin the narrative as their victims versus no, 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 no. These are choices. You get to own them. Paul, oh. Hank, Hank Senate called us on the air and said, um, guess who this is? You'll get three guesses. Okay, and now they're going to play that, but I don't need to. So let me just let me yeah. just figure out exactly the end of it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, fired. What do we do? There were no second chances with that guy. Huh? That well, they air. claimed he was kidding, but I don't know. <laughs> we were shitting our pants. If you don't know, the, the twelve more shows you did weren't a clue. <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't know. Were we fired? We did twelve more shows. Until the school year ended and everybody left. <laughs> exactly. Looks like, like a Joe. Joe. Oh. Uh, one of our... My pants. <laughs> okay. First of all, I don't know Did why... Did you know it was him? I figured it out like halfway through with the, the call. And I didn't want to say it. And then when he goes, you're fired. 
And what was all that static and I everything don't know. too? Okay. I don't remember the next part. One second. And we were we were like we 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 couldn't even get through the rest of the show. We barely got through it. <laughs> so you did get to go back on yeah, the Yeah, we went back and and it was weird. We walked out of the so we didn't want to freak out Bruce and Joel. So you didn't tell them? I, I think we just kind of said, let's just finish this and then we'll deal with it later. I was a kid. <laughs> I was a kid. <laughs> he was like five years old. Yeah. Twenty and years way, old 20. and twenty one is not a kid. 20. I don't remember. I, it's so it's so when you think about the fact that he wrote private parts. Only 20, 20 years after this happened? Yes. And he can claim I remember nothing about it? I mean, it's only been 20 years since mm -hmm. this day. And you were an adult at the time. Mm -hmm. But how do you confuse having done one and only one show and, oh, yeah, we did it for the entire school year. I forgot all about that. Or for the yeah. entire semester. I forgot there's all no about way. that. There's weekly. no way. There's no way you forget. As Sam said already perfectly, you don't forget why you got fired. You don't get forget where you get fired from. And you don't forget who fired you. These are things no. that kind of – because it's a failure. I mean it, people yeah. remember their failures. or if they, if, I mean if they're normal human beings and they try to learn from them. Um, he could listen not to how Listen to how he talks about AGT for years, years yes. and years <laughs> and years. And he's going to claim, I don't know. I don't know what it was. It was weird. He tro he tried he treated that show as serious as ninety five percent cancer, and then when fired when he was let go, oh, said that's it was a that quote. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, mm. let me let, let me play the rest of this. It was like eighteen years old. I didn't know what was going right. on. What? And I was, and I was did, did... <laughs> go ahead, Sam. I'm sorry. At 18, I signed a lease for an apartment and owned a car. Like yeah. I, yeah. I just. I can't fathom this stupidity. And You're an adult. <laughs> like, what do you mean? Unbelievable. What do you and mean? And he wasn't 18. He was 20. He was 20. Yeah. So now that he's playing with the years as well. The King Schmaltz bagel hour ever go on again? Yeah. It so did. He we, didn't fire you. He didn't really. He says he was kidding. Did, did that sound like a guy who was kidding? He didn't sound like he was kidding. Yeah. Right then. You okay, did so. 12 more shows. What are you talking about? <laughs> By the way, all were that you tiptoeing in into the studio and like, he's not looking. Let's turn on the, the microphones. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Well, who was hiding him? He's like 12 feet tall. That's right. And this is one last yeah. clip. It's called They Fired Me. No, they didn't. Yes, they did. <laughs> You haven't heard of the King Schmaltz Bagel Hour? It's <laughs> me and three other guys, and we cut it up on this. This is from 2020, November 3rd. <laughs> so a year after, a year after he's done, he's admitted he wasn't fired. Yeah, it's pretty good. We got fired. <laughs> Idiot. Got fired from your free job. <laughs> I got fired. I got fired from the, the the college radio station. I'm paying so I can go. Like no, Ben's paying, and he's no. gonna he double. He's gonna you yeah. know he's gonna hey, go between that and more. Yeah, he's paying for thirteenth and fourth grade, fourteenth grade, and your car and your monastery. You loser. Yeah, practice. <laughs> How do you get fired from something you're paying for? Uh. I managed to do that. Well, you don't get fired. First of all, you get kicked off. It's not when you're not getting paid. It's not a it's not a job. Um, the way that he talks about <clears throat> King Schmaltz, even though it's you know somewhat tongue in cheek, but yeah, they only did a total of twelve hours of material. That's yeah. that's a work week for Howard Stern. <laughs> you know, consider <laughs> that that ha probably half of that was music because they played yeah. music as well. Yeah. So and then the other half was them. Doing inside jokes about can someone please call in so that we can hear yeah. from our fan. It's very I mean, there's not very much material. There's a reason why you only ever hear of Godzilla goes to Harlem out of twelve hours of King Schmaltz material. Hundred percent. The way the way he talks about this too, do you know how mad I get when I think about my student loans that I paid off? Like I'm done, but I'm just like, fuck you. It's just like yeah. unbelievable. <laughs> and guys, I'm really we're going to play the rest of this clip and then we're going to sign off. I'm sorry we didn't get further into um, uh, chapter three because it's really short anyway. But it's because we want to really, really do this one justice because he's mythologized King Schmaltz for so fucking long. I wanted mm -hmm. it to be the definitive statement of complete and utter bullshit before we continue forward. So no stone unturned, guys. Call up a guy named Hank Sennett. Lives in Massachusetts somewhere, and he he fired me.
<laughs> I, my parents were paying for me to go to college five thousand yeah. dollars a year, and they fired me from the free college radio station. Okay, so there's that. We'll leave that uh, alone, guys. Uh, I want to. If you guys want to, anything to say before we sign off on this one? So he's throwing a temper tantrum <laughs> that his parents, who are paying five thousand dollars, and by the way, nineteen. Actually, think about that. Five thousand dollars in nineteen. What was it? You said seventy two. Seventy seventy four. This would have been that's the that's 90, the equivalent of like twenty five twenty twenty five thousand. That's a lot of maybe money. More. Yeah, that's a lot yeah. of money. Oh fuck yeah! Nineteen seventy four, five thousand dollars. Yeah, Ben Stern did. Ben Stern did very well. He did because that's yeah. a ton of money for college. Even though he'll go, he'll go on and say he only earned twenty five thousand a year, one year or something. Like he he claims this one figure constituted Ben's earnings for the rest of his life. Yeah, he never adjusts that number for inflation. No, it's same, same with, with the ninety six dollars a week. Yeah, exactly. Never adjust that for inflation. Because I just went to a birthday party today. Rick's aunt turned a hundred years old. Oh wow! So she was born in nineteen twenty one, and they had a board up, and it said an average price of a home was seven thousand five hundred dollars you could buy, mm, and amazing. the price of gasoline was twenty six cents. So the price of college was $5,000 in 1974. That's now something to think about. 72. That's, that's yeah. 19, yeah. And 74, yeah, because he, he would have been 20 and 74. So it's, and that's, oh, 74, you know, taking, sorry, Howard's word, that's taking Howard's word for it. I don't know if that's accurate. Yeah, who knows? We'll have to look at the alumni list and see his, his graduation photo, but, uh, but even though there is that. one what in a, private What a parts. piece of shit. And now he's bitching about, my it's my free radio show that they're taking away from me, even though I'm not even paying for college. Always a victim. Always a victim. Um, guys, thank you so much for sticking with us on this one. When we get into the next one, we're going to finish chapter three and go into chapter four because he, in earnest, starts getting towards uh, his radio career, which starts out being a very straight conservative uh, DJ. And uh, we'll have here from Meg Griffin and other people from the time of that uh, whole broadcast. And we'll see what we can get some clips from that era as well. So thank you guys so much. Stay safe. Take care. We love you. Bye, guys. Gay it's boy, great. rock star, friends with Allison, oxycodone, off context, my child, through pill, social worker, CNN. <laughs> off <Off-context. laughs> <laughs> Press no. release, Beverly no. Hills, love I snack, like diet drink. I like you a lot. Black no. guy at Wendy's. <laughs> going, going, come on, you're great. This is great. Linda Perry, Road Songs, Patty and Samantha, Women Give, Jessica Sinzi, I'm happy. <laughs> ABC, okay. ABC. Divine bass players. <laughs>